Whoa, those plugins look really cool. And I've seen some super famous mixers use them. I bet they'll sound awesome. But what do I actually use them on? And what am I listening for their awesomeness? Compression can be mysterious at first. But once you learn to use the stock compressor on your console or digital audio workstation, it can be really helpful to try some different models. So you might have seen these plugins, but you don't know exactly what to use them on. So today I'm going to teach you about the different flavors that these plugin compressors can offer so that you can get a great mix and sweet sounds going faster than a snowflake can get offended. In this video, I'm going to focus on the compressors that were mostly made with inputs in mind. The LA-2A, the 1176, the LA-3A, and the DBX-160. And on the next video, I'll tell you all about the ones that were made for outputs. Now, for trademark reasons, they might not be called exactly this, but you get the idea and you'll recognize it when you see it. In each section, I'll talk about what it's good for, what it's not good for, and the things to look out for so that you don't abuse your compressor. Compression abuse is something we can all work to avoid. Hey, if you're new here and you're passionate about making church sound great so that people can focus on Jesus, go ahead and hit subscribe and ding the little bell to get notified every time new content drops. The first one we're going to take a look at is the LA-2A. The original was a tube compressor that used an optical circuit, but you don't need to know all that nerdy stuff. All you really need to know is that it's a very transparent compression with a very slow attack time. It operates really smoothly and it has a soft knee. Basically, the transition from when it's not compressing at all to when it's applying the full ratio is very gentle. The other thing that it imparts is a nice gooey tube sound. Now, it's not going to be like distortion on your guitar amp, but it kind of gives this harmonic goodness that just feels nice and warm. Warning. Warning. Feelings alert. Feelings alert. Nerd delving into emotions. Nerd delving into emotions. The thing that the LA-2A really excels on is vocals. It can give you a lot of gain reduction without a lot of artifacts. So you can really crank down on it, but you don't really notice that it's there. And that's the thing that you have to watch out for, is sometimes in live sound especially, you can get a lot of gain reduction and end up pushing up your noise floor to recover for it. This can create feedback or push up a lot of noise. So even if you're not hearing the compression artifacts, watch that meter to make sure that you're not going too far. There's only two main knobs on the LA-2A, gain and peak reduction. Peak reduction acts like the threshold. So you turn that up and it's essentially pulling the threshold down. The gain is an output gain stage. So after you've applied your gain reduction with the compression, you can boost that up to get a little bit more out of it. This is the stage that gives you that gooey feeling. So you might experiment a little bit with your gain structure to see if running that hotter gets you a little bit more of that tube sound. The other thing you want to watch out for is the release time. Now, some models versus other ones have a faster or slower release time because they're modeling different analog units that had some variation. And one person loved this particular unit and another person loved this particular unit. So I'm not getting on the companies for choosing the one that I don't love for their model that they made, but just know that there's some variation between models on this, and the release time is what you really have to look out for. So while I love it on vocals and on bass, it does okay on the kick drum, because it's got such a slow attack time, all that punch comes through. But I don't love it on snare, overheads, or guitars really, or anything that's needing some aggression in its compression. I also don't love it on groups, but you might, so give it a shot and let me know in the comments what you think. Enough talk. Let's listen to some examples. And how about I give you my ashes? And how about I give you my sickness? How about I give you my depression? And how about I give you my weakness? How about I...
So to recap, the LA-2A is one of my go-to compressors for bass and for vocals. The next one we're gonna look at is the 1176. And this is a totally different animal than the LA-2A. While the LA-2A was really nice and slow, the 1176 is really, really fast. It has a really hard knee, but the harmonic characteristic that it adds is totally different from the LA-2A. There were more than two versions of this, but the two main ones that you'll find are the Blackface and the Blue Stripe. The main difference between the two is a texture thing that you're just gonna have to hear to understand. And how about I give you my ashes? How about I give you my sickness? How about I give you my depression? Now the 1176's claim to fame is that it has a super fast attack time without creating artifacts. This can give you a really great in your face sound that EQ alone can't do. Because the range of the attack time is so fast, it can tend to make things brighter or snappier. The slowest attack time is still under a millisecond. On the kick drum, I'd only go this route if it was a kick out microphone and I needed more snap and already had plenty of punch. You won't get any more punch out of this, especially if you're trying to flex your subs. It's all about the low end. If you're needing a lot of snap from your kick drum, that can work awesome. If you need some aggression out of your bass, that can be cool too, but can also knock down some of the low end or make it less apparent so that it doesn't feel quite as thick. The other tricky thing about this compressor is the gain staging. You basically have a fixed threshold inside the unit and an input control and an output control. The more you drive the input into the unit, the harder it's going to push into that threshold. So by raising the input gain, you're essentially lowering the threshold. But if you do this on a vocal mic and live sound, you can drive up the input gain and the noise to the point where it feeds back. And that's really a problem. You don't wanna make that sound tech solo. So the trick for this is to dial back the output first and then turn up the input to match it. Fine tuning each one of those until you get the right amount of gain reduction and the right amount of makeup gain. So let's listen to some more examples of that. Hallelujah for the Lord our God. He reigns, he reigns. We have come to give you the glory. We give you glory. You're, and you're the Lord our God. Yes, you reign. Let's declare you reign. You reign. You reign. You reign. You reign, you reign, you reign, you reign, you reign. You stand alone in glory and majesty, you stand alone in glory and majesty, you stand alone in glory and majesty, you stand alone, you stand alone. The other cool thing that these plugins do is modeling the all buttons in function. 
Basically, if you had a hardware unit and you jammed all four of your fingers on the ratio buttons at the same time, you could get all the buttons to lock in and it gave this crazy ratio and a little bit more distortion that was really, really fun. So to recap, the 1176 is great for making things bright and in your face, giving it a nice hard distortion or smooth sheen, depending on which model you're modeling. And you've gotta watch out for the gain structure to avoid a sound tech solo. Now let's take a look at the LA-3A. On the surface and in name, it looks really similar to the LA-2A, but it's got a lot of differences. The similarity is that it just has two knobs, the peak reduction and the gain, but inside it behaves a lot differently. It's got a much faster attack time, even though it uses the same opto type circuit. It can work great at putting electric and acoustic guitars in their place and keeping them there, but it either works or it doesn't. If it doesn't do what you need it to do, you're just gonna have to pick another plugin. The next compressor we're going to look at is the DBX160. What makes this different is that it's an RMS compressor with an auto attack and release time. Basically the attack and the release adjust based on what input signal it sees. RMS means root mean squared, which is some fancy math to take an average of something that's oscillating back and forth. Because if you just took the pure average of something that's going back and forth, your average would be zero. And that's not really helpful for us in compression. So we try to use the RMS signal to look at more of the average changes compared to the peak changes. Now we could have a nerd discussion about this for a long time, but RMS compressors tend to feel like they behave slower than their peak compressor counterparts. Now again, because it's so simple, it either works on your input or it doesn't. I like it on some drums and don't like it on other drums. It depends on the end result or the sound that I'm going for. You've got ratio control, you've got threshold, and you've got output gain. It's pretty simple. So if it doesn't work, you're just gonna have to try something else. All right, let's listen to some examples. On the kick drum and snare drum, it's so-so eh, for me on these particular drums. It depends how the drum is tuned and dampened. It just might or might not work. Now where I really like it is on toms. It just gives this tightness to the low end that I really enjoy. It's kind of the easy button and I'm definitely gonna be trying this more in the future. Now I really like the way that it operates on overheads. It gives me a nice gentle transition between the detail -y stuff when the drummer's playing light and when they're really going for it and beating on the drums hard, it does that well too. For an overall kit sound, it sounds great, especially when I dump out a lot of mid range from the overheads.
On the base, it just feels nice and fat and round. And it also brings out a little bit of grit, which I like too. On the acoustic guitar, I really like the way that a lower ratio, like 2.5 to 1, works. And because it's an RMS compressor, it likes the peaks and the transients through. So you get the overall level changes, you get the sustain increase, but you're not missing that attack that I really like that kind of pops out at you with acoustics. <laughs> On electrics, it adds nice fatness and sustain, so I call that one a winner. And on piano, it feels really good too. Just like the acoustic guitar, it lets the transients through but increases the sustain. On vocals, it feels good, it's simple, it's hard not to like. We lift your name up higher, higher. We lift your name up, Jesus be glorified. We lift your name up higher, higher. We lift your name up. Jesus be so we'll sing hallelujah, hallelujah for the Lord our God. He reigns, he reigns. Mastering the art of compression is only one piece in making church sound great every single week. So if you want help clarifying your goals and getting everything in line so that every week sounds great, I have a free guide for you called How to Lead Your Church Sound Team. You can find it through the link in the description below. Now, disclaimer, compression can be addicting, so please use responsibly. And don't get depressed if nobody else at parties wants to talk about compression and compression plugins. But if we have a Worship Sound Wisdom meetup sometime, we can totally break off the needle of the nerdo meter talking about compression. Hey, if this video was helpful for you, go ahead and share it with a friend and mash that thumbs up button. Don't forget to hit subscribe and ding the little bell. And remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo, and nobody leaves church humming the kick drum, no matter how good the compression sounds on it. We'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio. Oh, hey! Don't forget to check out this video down here and this video down here.